Hi, this is Greg from Structural Toolkit, and in this video we're going to go through a cantilever post footing design. Designing a post and footing can be completed using several modules. The first part of the design involves the post itself, which depending on material type can be designed in various ways, such as by using the timber or steel member design, along with the wind loads module to calculate our wind pressure as needed. These modules will also provide us with the moment and shear force at the base of our post for our footing design. The footing itself can then be designed for overturning resistance using the post footing module, where we can use methods for cohesive or cohesionless soil. For our example, we'll be designing a steel post that's fixed to the top of a circular footing. The post is going to be 2.5 meters high and it will form part of the supports for a braced timber frame flat roof. There will be a resultant wind force from the roof, which will be resisted by the steel posts, and the footing will then resist the overturning at the bottom. We've gone through how to use the wind loads module before to determine our wind pressure in our wind analysis video. So for this video, we'll assume we've completed a wind analysis and arrived at a design ultimate wind pressure of 0.68 kPa without drag coefficients. Now, depending on the situation, layout of the building and roof, there are several ways we could arrive at a suitable force at the top of our post. One way is to work out the effective load area of the roof that will contribute to a force at the top of the post and multiply that by our wind pressure and coefficients. For this example, we'll take a typical 0.7 windward and 0.5 leeward coefficient value. We'll assume there is then three meters squared of area of roof causing a force on three posts. Given the roof is braced, we can assume that the forces will distribute out equally into each post, which gives us a force per post of our wind pressure multiplied by coefficients, multiplied by the area divided by three which gives us 0.8 kilonewtons. The post itself will also have a UDL wind force on it. Appendix C gives us our shape factor for an individual member. Our KI will be one and we'll keep things simple and also take our KAR as one, which is conservative. That just leaves the drag coefficient of CD. For our example, we'll use a square with face to wind, giving us a coefficient of 2.2. This then gives us a resulting shape factor of 2.2 also. In other situations, this value may change depending on section type and wind speed used. Using this shape vector, we get a force of 0.68 multiplied by 2.2, giving us 1.5 kPa. We'll then multiply this later by the width of our column to give us our kilonewtons per meter force. For our footing, we'll assume our soil report has shown that there is 200 millimeters of fill, with sand below providing an angle of internal friction of 30 degrees and a unit weight of 18 kilonewtons per meter cubed. This means we will need to use the cohesionless method for our post footing. The theory behind the footing design methods are the same as that of the sleeper retaining wall design, being methods by Hoskin. We covered this in a previous video on concrete sleeper wall designs. So assuming the wind analysis is complete, our first part of the design is the steel post. So we'll open up a steel member design. For our design, we'll call it post PO1. If you're using a timber post instead, you'd follow the same method we're about to go through, but just with the timber member design. Depending on your post cross section, you would also need to use the corresponding shape factor for it. So the next thing we'll do is open up a linked analysis document. We'll then put in our span of 2.5 meters and our span type as cantilever. In order to design for wind, we'll set our live load type as wind and also turn off our self weight to the right as we are only dealing with horizontal loads. With the load type changed, our second row of loads is now set for wind loads. So in our UDL section, we can put in our UDL on the post being 1.5 kPa multiplied by the width of the post. We'll assume now that we'll be able to get an 89 SHS to work. So we'll round that up and multiply our force in the cell by 0.09. For good measure, we'll put in a comment here to show what we've done. Rather than manually resizing the comment ourselves, what we can do is right click on it and go auto size comment. Next we can put our point load on in the point load section. At the start of the video we worked out that we have a load at the top of the post of 0.8 kilonewtons. So we'll put that in the first column. And to be consistent, we'll put a comment here as well. 
We know that our force was distributed into three posts. So we can just type in here 2.4 kilonewtons divided by th three posts. And auto size the column in again. As our cantilever support is on the right hand side, we'll put in our point load position as zero. Now, depending on your wind analysis, your ratio of WS to W may not be 0.68, and it would be at this point that you would want to change it for your specific situation. In our case, we have 0.68, so we can leave the default here as it is. With the loading done, we can switch back to the design page. And in here, we'll first pick our square hollow section. We'll start with a 3.5 millimeter. We'll also want to change our span to 2500 on this document and set our alpha M to 1.75. For a cantilever bending moment, that has the tip restrained from moving out of plane. Depending on what your bending moment diagram looks like, this value might be different. Careful consideration of what kind of end restraints you might have will be needed. Next, we can bring in our moment and deflection by pressing the max M negative, as we are dealing with a negative moment. This brings in our moment, which is fine for moment capacity. However, deflection is bringing up a warning as it has exceeded the predefined deflection limit of height on 250. At this point, you should be considering what a suitable deflection limit for your structure might actually be. Depending on the brittleness of the structure, noting that table C1 of AS1170.0 nominates column side sway to be height on 500 for serviceability wind. We'll keep the default to height on 250 as we have a flexible structure. And so we'll just bump up the thickness of our member to 5 millimeters. With that change in section, we are now at a deflection of height on 277, being within our chosen limit. With our post design done, we can now design our footing. But before that, we'll want to get our ultimate shear and moment forces at the base of the column. In our case, this is 2.42 kilonewton meters and 1.14 kilonewtons. We'll round these up to 2.5 and 1.2 respectively to keep things simple. With those noted, we can now open up the post footing design. For this example, post footing BP01 is suitable enough. This module has several design methods that are represented under each tab that we can see at the bottom. The first method being under the signboard tab, as the name suggests, was developed for signboard footings that resist wind loads. The second method is by Minikin which is from wind, waves, and maritime structures, effectively being used for impact resistance of piers. There are distinct similarities between Minikin and the signboards. Both the signboards and Minikin are applicable to instantaneous loadings and not sustained loadings. The third and fourth methods are the ones we would be mostly interested in, being a post footing designed for either cohesive or cohesionless soils, where both of these use methods by Hosking. The final method comes from AS4676-2000, being for utility poles, but was withdrawn as a standard in 2017, so the method is mostly for informative purposes now. So for our design, as we're going to be founded in the sand, we'll want to look at the cohesionless tab. The actual inputs are fairly straightforward. Firstly, we can input our loadings, being 2.5 kilonewton meters for the moment, and 1.2 kilonewtons for the lateral load. As we have already resolved our forces to the base of the column, the load height will be zero. This eccentricity is used to resolve the moment force to the top of the resistance soil, which we will see later. For our total depth of footing, we'll put in a tentative 1200. As we are saying there is 200 millimeters of fill, we will ignore the top 200 millimeters of soil, effectively setting it as the soil that will not resist any moment or force for this design. We'll want to keep a standardized diameter and make construction easy, so 450 millimeters should do the job. As we discussed at the start of the video, our soil has an angle of internal friction of 30 degrees and soil weight of 18 kilonewtons per meters cubed, provided by the soil report. So we can leave the defaults as they are. Using Rankine theory, the active and passive pressure coefficients are then calculated. Alternatively, you can input your own manual values here if provided for you. With all the inputs complete, we can look at the capacity check that is performed below. The overturning moment is calculated at the top of the resisting soil, and so the ignored soil depth and load height will be multiplied by the lateral load to provide an additional moment resolved at this location. In our case, we had a base moment of 2.5 kilonewton meters, and then an additional moment of 1.2 kilonewtons multiplied by 0.2 for the ignored soil. 
given a total of 2.7 kilonewton meters. The resistance provided by the saw was then based on the cohesionless method by Hoskin. This method does come with a few assumptions, such that the saw is unsubmerged and that a pure moment is applied to the foundation, with shear force being ignored. With our inputs, we can see we're a bit over capacity, so what we can do is press the fine socket button to find the optimal depth for the footing. Pressing the button gives us a depth of just under 1300 millimeters. So to keep the dimensions simple, we'll just specify 1300. If we were instead in a cohesive soil, then the inputs would be very similar, except that instead of internal friction, we would use cohesion. The cohesion value is likely an undrayed cohesion, and the value should be considered carefully in conjunction with geotechnical advice. The method of design is also then based on a cohesive soil model instead by Hoskin, which is based on a shear slip circle of the footing. Given this, it should be expected that the footing must remain short and stiff, effectively non-flexural. So keeping the aspect ratio to less than 1 in 4 is suggested. One thing that we haven't considered in this video is how the post is fixed into the top of the footing. When doing a design, it will be something that needs to be considered. An example of a common fixing is a plate welded to the bottom of the column that is then bolted into the top of the footing. In this case, our moment at the base would create a force couple that will apply a pull-out force in the bolts on one side. The plate itself is also going to be subjected to some moment. Using those forces, you can then determine the capacity of the bolts and also the plate. That about covers all you need to know for designing a post footing in Toolkit. Feel free to check out our website and our other videos for more tutorials and help with using this software. If you have any questions, please contact our support team via email or by calling us. Thanks for watching. Thank you.